ACP joint networks. Um, how many of you are quite familiar with DFAMS? Who is attending for the very first time here? So I'll just brief you up about DFAMS. So DFAMS is a monthly event organized in networks. It is about knowledge, technical knowledge sharing between geeks and other guys. So it's, it's basically organized by geek of uh, the passionate programmers and sponsored by ThoughtWorks. So this happens generally on first Wednesday of every month, unless it's a public holiday or some circumstances like the new invasion plus which generally doesn't happen in India. So yeah, today's uh, topic is about breaking down the model. DevOps has revolutionized the automation of uh, infrastructure. Like it is unprecedented as of now. So, uh, my microservices is, is some new breed of applications which is coming up rapidly growing in the age of DevOps. So yeah, uh, this microservices type of development helps your application to be scalable, maintainable, and fault tolerant. And now I think now is the age where legacy systems and new age systems should coexist together. So is your I mean the the legacy systems probably that might be in your organization or able to, to be broken broke down or can they is, is, is the microservice the way for you people so these several questions will be answered in this session so we have three speakers today uh, first one who is going to speak is, his name is Akosh he is a software engineer based out of London so he works for a UK healthcare startup uh, he is like uh, a full stack experience specializing in JVM packages and currently he is working on putting an accessible and affordable healthcare into each and everyone, hands of each and everyone in this world. And then we have Chandan Kumar. He is a application developer in ThoughtWorks. He has an overall experience of 13 years. So currently he is helping a lot of this healthcare firm into scaling up. And his recent work include we are protecting the tech solution for a logistics firm. And then the third speaker is going to be Anil Kumar. He's, he has uh, four years of professional experience and he's application developer at ThoughtWorks and he's experience in developing the, sorry, breaking down the model. So, yeah, I welcome Akush today. Hi, uh, oh, yes. Um, so hi, my name is Akush. I'm uh, currently just visiting India, and my uh, colleagues here or have roped me in to do this uh, section of the talk. So uh, hopefully you'll find it uh, useful. So uh, just to recap, our agenda for today will be an overview of monoliths and microservices and how they compare. When we do, when would you choose which one? And then we'll look at two case studies. One is a gradual migration, and one is a bit more big bang approach. So, uh, a show of hands, who has, who knows what a monolith is? Who knows what a microservice is? Okay, so it seems like more people know what microservices are than what monoliths are, but uh, hopefully we'll, this, will, this will be useful to everyone here. Um, so starting off, what, what is a monolith? Monolith is not really well defined, but um, it, it is an architectural style. So you kind of like choose that you want to structure how you structure like your code and your business logic. So if you're structuring it in one large code base, that's typically a single deployable unit of of application. Then that's what we call a monolith. So here we see on the diagram. No. So in the diagram, we can see that this monolithic app is serving everything. It's doing our HTML server-side rendering. It even contains JS code that's also running in the HTML pages. It contains all our service logic, all our data access logic. It contains everything in one large code base. And typically, monoliths only interact with one single database or data store engine. So is, is a monolith bad? Based on the based on articles that you may have been reading, based on um, certain things, you might think that it is, but actually it depends. If your monolith looks on the left side, then it's probably not too bad. It actually can be quite good. If it's more on the right-hand side, then uh, 
yes, it is, it is quite bad if it's a large spaghetti mess of code that's very difficult to maintain. So looking at some of the uh, pros and cons. Um, so some of the advantages of monoliths is that your calls are interprocessed. This is actually the very traditional way of thinking about programming, that you call a method and you instantly get a response and it's interprocessed. There's no complexities around. Failure typically happens due to business code and not due to the call itself. Um, the development is actually simple. So people who've worked with monoliths, you typically need to install maybe a database engine, check out the code, run some start command, and bam, you have the monolith running. You have your whole application already running on your machine. So and doing changes there is just in the single code base. You might need to do search and find the portion of the code that is uh, doing that piece of logic you want to fix, and then you fix it, do the change, and it's done. Doing the same thing in a microservices, microservice environment is slightly more difficult. Testing is arguably also simpler because all your code is there. I mean, testing when, when we're talking about, um, so there's, there's, there's downsides uh, to a monolith and testing a monolith, but generally like, you can use all the common frameworks that you have available. For example, in the land of Java, you have JUnit. You can use JUnit to test your whole application. You can't really test the microservices architecture with JUnit. In itself, like you need a lot of other things to help you test that environment. Deployments are simple, right? A monolith has one single deployment pipeline from your code to maybe a dev environment, a staging environment, a pre prod, prod, UAT, QA, whatever environment, but it's one single de deployment pipeline and not n deployment pipelines where n equals the number of microservices. So uh, at my current company, we have over 100 microservices running. That's 100 different deployment pipelines. So like, it is arguably simpler. And because of this, deployments are simple, infrastructure is also simpler. All your um, infrastructure is only focused around running the monolith. So a lot of monolithic architectures can easily run on a virtual machine directly on the box, right? You have typically one, uh, one dependency, one language to support. In the case of uh, JVM languages, you, have to, you just need to have Java installed on the virtual machine. If you're doing Ruby on Rails, all you need is Ruby. If you're doing um, Python or like Django, all you need is Python. That's it. And it's easy to manage. So some of the cons are that you have a, with the monolithic code architecture, there's, there's not a lot of domain boundaries generally in code. And this is mostly due to dev developer discipline. Generally, developers are quite messy when they start to uh, hack in things, and especially the first designs are usually nice. First designs are nice, but when change after change after change comes in, the architecture just like shifts, and there are no domain boundaries. You'll have like notifications doing some weird stuff and calling some other code here that it really shouldn't be, but no one actually caught it during the pair programming or code review process. Because of this, it, it becomes quite terrible to maintain after a while. It also limits your technology stack to a single thing. So this is more common with um, uh, Ruby on Rails, Python, Django, um, the, in the Java land, the Java server faces, and C Sharp, ASP.NET. Like, these typically all kind of tell you how to do things. It's a single technology stack. Mixing and trying out new technologies is not something that you can do easily in a monolithic architecture. It's also difficult to change, and the change, difficultness to change mostly comes from the things I mentioned about lack of domain boundaries. It's actually, in a well-structured monolith, it's easy to change. But usually monoliths tend to move over into an area where they become a mess. And because of this mess, you pull in one area, and then suddenly something else breaks in a totally different area. So a monolith might also have slow build and test times. So I've heard of monolithic applications that to fully test require hours, which is like, for me, like unheard of. Like, I haven't worked ever on a project that required an hour to test. Um, it also might have a slow QA process. Um, so when, when, when you do a change, suddenly you need to retest all your features, right? You need to re-QA all your features. And if you have a lot of manual QA and you're relying on a lot of manual QA, 
then a tiny change, no matter how small, means you need to do a full regression test of the whole application. Because of this, like you can have actually a slow QA process where QA finds an issue, a regression, and then suddenly new changes come in, and those also need to be QA'd, and suddenly they find another issue that holds up their release again. So because of this, it can get in a quite vicious cycle. So the most common issue, though, is that models don't scale. What do we mean by scale? They don't scale in terms of dev process. So it's actually not in terms of CPU resources or memory or hardware resources. It's actually the dev process that does not really scale in, that, in terms of models. That said, this is, this is generalization. If, if your scaling issues are uh, hardware, then you have a very good problem because that means like you have a ton of users and that's a good problem to have. That means you probably have a lot of funding, money, et cetera, so you can afford to hire developers to work on this problem. But most of the time, models break down due to dev process. So large development teams, in my experience, that already happens past 20 developers. I've heard stories that um, uh, hundreds of developers are capable of working on a single monolith. That requires a lot of discipline. And as I mentioned, developers typically don't have that discipline to maintain those high quality standards in terms of code architecture. So as I already mentioned, each change means that you need a full QA. And this is where, this is where you get into a vicious cycle. If, if QA notices a bug, that suddenly means your release is locked. And then you have more changes stacking up, like all those other 18 developers or 19 developers wanna, are still continually developing new features. And it's blocking your full release just because your, your feature has a bug in it and it's not able to be released. Also, when if a bug or issue gets into production, it breaks everything, right? Like, like if, if, for example, it's a critical bug and your application actually crashes, then it's only like your whole, all your features across the board, be it everything, they don't work anymore. And rollbacks, they cause bottlenecks. So let's say, um, you do release a feature and it's not, it's not that bad, but you roll back to a previous version of the application, then suddenly you, as I mentioned, all the other changes coming in from other developers, they stack up and suddenly the next release when you go back is going to be even bigger amount of, like larger amount of change, which means it requires even more rigorous QA. So a personal experience was that when this started happening, that we had a few, two of these stack up, suddenly the, we, we typically release twice a week. Suddenly, we had a four week worth of change that we need to release in a single release. That was a high risk release. It required a lot of effort, like three developers just working on making sure that the release is gonna work as expected. So because of that, it, it's, it actually is a very big issue in terms of depth process. So lack of domain boundaries, as I mentioned, it, it means that it's quite difficult to maintain good internal architecture in terms of your code. And this is where uh, people who have actually joined projects, I'm quite sure there's many of you in the audience that join a project and you're like, what is this doing? Like all this code, doing all these weird things and I don't understand it. There's no domain problem, there's no kind of context. You have payments calling notifications that are calling email sending that's doing a order checkout and then the whole thing is like, why? Like, there's no clear design architecture that happens there. So essentially, monolithically, what you end up with is a whole mess of calls going through down to your database somewhere, and then it actually prevents evolution and slows you down to a ground big halt. And this is a spaghetti monster of, of spaghetti code. But that said, there are signs of big monolith. So there's many, uh, there are many companies out there that are running monolithic architectures. One, um, one today is Etsy, for example. They're like an art company. They have around 50 engineers working on the same code base, but they exhibit these signs of having a strong, comprehensive, and quick test suite. So quick, how do you get like a quick test suite? Well, you need to parallelize. You need to make sure that you test your monolith in parallel, and only the slowest portion will be the limiting factor. Requires no minimal manual QA, and because of that, it can be deployed many times a day. So rather than not like twice a week, it's actually three, four, five times a day. And Etsy actually does this, so that's, that's the difference. And internally, 
Like you actually need to do almost domain driven design internally and structure your code into modules. And you can actually leverage technologies out there that helps you help you with this. So who, whoever's working with Java, you have Java 9 introduced Jigsaw, which you, you can actually structure your code that you cannot call any class that you want, but you can limit um, what you expose. Um, JavaScript engineers, you can use uh, MPM modules even internally in your own code base that you break down your domain into separate modules and then pull them together in your monolithic app. Ruby on Rails, again, you can use gems. Like, there are many solutions out there, but it all requires work, right? And developer discipline to structure all your code into separate packages, modules, whatever you want to call them. So, moving on. What, what is a microservice then? So microservices are even less well defined, to be honest. Like the, the best the best kind of approximation we can get to is that they're small enough, but not too large. So they're, they're somewhere like kind of there. Some people like to think of it like, oh, it's it's small enough that you can understand it in an hour or something like that. Like people kind of try to like uh, use these types of approximations for a microservice, but in my mind, they're, they're more about like a single domain, and it, it, it can be deployed on its own, and it owns its own data. And here we see like an example where we have like an online shopping service, and we have these separate services that all have their own um, databases, and they only interact with that data and maybe other services. So examples of microservice sites are like which you might find in almost any every company, every architecture is like a email service, a payment service, a push notification service, a chat service, an authentication service. So these, these types of concerns that you just want to structure in a separate service rather than having them all bunched together in a model. And uh, for example, in the case of server-side rendered HTML, uh, for example, Ruby on Rails, you know, typically render HTML on the server-side, like, a new service would actually be your front end and a front end web application using something like React or Angular, all these modern JavaScript frameworks. That essentially is a service itself because it's calling your other services, right? So, what you end up is you actually distribute your model, right? You, you take from one code base, push it out into all these separate services that are all interacting with each other, forming a bit of a mesh, right? Like it's a, it's a bit of a service mesh. So looking at some of the pros and cons, um, microservices, I think like the best part is that they serve as clear boundaries, right? The boundary part and the domain part, in my opinion, is very important. That you have a clear boundary, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, no one, I hope, I hope no one goes into like a payments service and then starts adding push notification logic in there. I hope no one would actually approve that and let that go through because, you know, it's like, it's an instant thing that, oh, it doesn't belong there, it's not supposed to be in that service. Well, in a model, it's like, you don't have this instant gut reaction that it's not supposed to be there. In a model, it's like, oh, it's fine. We'll deal with it later, we'll refactor it later. <laughs> um, so it also results in uh, smaller teams, which I think uh, reduces communication, reduces, um, kind of uh, developers conflicting with other developers when they're developing code. It, you can deploy a microservice in isolation. So rather than having everything held up, you know, the issue I just mentioned about QA process being blocked until all the full thing is QA, you can QA just the microservice and deploy it in isolation. And if, for example, you need to roll it black, back, then only the other changes in that single service are the ones that need to be rolled back and not all the other services. So you can also use a set of diverse technologies. I think this is arguably not maybe the best thing to do to have every technology under the sun inside your architecture, but it allows you to actually experiment with newer technologies. So you might hear like, oh, Go is the new thing and we should all be writing our services in Go or like whatever then you can actually quickly prototype a microservice and go see how it feels, see how easy it is for developers to pick it up, and then have a few services written in Go, and some written in Node, others written in Java, and you can actually choose the best tool for the problem at hand. So for example, Node is amazing at uh, I.O. and uh, communicating with other services. It's not too great for CPU-bound tasks. So you can actually leverage 
the best of technologies. You might use um, Elixir or Erlang for when you have a lot of message passing type solutions. So the last part is that they're actually scalable. So microservices are scalable, but again, not in terms of, they are scalable in terms of performance, right? You're able to scale one function, one, let's say you have your login, and your login is hit 100 times more than any other business functionality that you have, then yes, you can scale your login functionality only by 100 nodes, but they're also scalable in terms of death process, right? You can have thousands of developers working on various microservices. And actually, like most companies, even when they have monoliths, they have multiple monoliths in their company. So they're, they're running the same concept. Like when, they, when they're not able to add to the same code base, they start splitting it out, but all of these end up in uh, monoliths themselves. So some of the downsides are that it, it does increase your infrastructure complexity, right? So with, with a monolith, you just have one stack, one deployment pipeline, literally a load balancer in front of your application servers, in front of, or rather in front of the web servers, the application servers and database. That's it, like a simple three, four tiered architecture, whatever you want to call it. But it was, it, was, it was much simpler. Now you have like load balancers for every microservice, you have databases for every microservice, and it, it just increases your complexity in your infrastructure. So I like to think about, the best way I think about it is you have your monolith, and when you're breaking it down, you actually just take that complexity and spread it out across your infrastructure. And that's the, that's the end result. So, and continuing, the other downside is that you have a ton of network calls. Network calls are unfortunately not as nice as inter-process calls. Network calls can easily fail, they take much more time, and we'll talk about this a bit more. Um, so distributed systems, is also a terrible downside. Anyone who's ever studied distributed systems knows that uh, it's an endless depth of complexity when you actually start to think about the problems. Of, we'll, we'll, we'll go through some of these fun, fun stuff a bit later, but like, distributed systems are essentially not simple. Uh, so it actually is very difficult to integration test in microservice architecture, right? So to test your business as a whole, let's say business flow that might touch 20 microservices, right? You need to launch and fire up all those 20 microservices just to test a single business flow, right? Suddenly it's much more difficult and you can fail at any single point in time. Compare that to a monolith where integration testing is just firing up one thing and then firing an HTTP request and getting responses, right? Here you, you, you need to have all that complexity and most of the times the issue is that in a microservice architecture your depend dependency tree never ends. So you end up needing to fire up your whole infrastructure just to test the thing. Or you're gonna have to start mocking. And like, where do you choose where you mock? Which, where, where do you choose where to stop bringing up dependencies and start mocking? So cross-domain changes are difficult. So let's say you wanna actually change uh, the way, I don't know, like your email templating works when you're doing uh, checkout in your shopping cart, right? Like it's like a lot of different microservices need changes. You need to modify many code bases, and you need to modify it so that API contracts don't break, because you can't actually break it. You can't release two microservices at the exact same time. So the APIs actually need to be backwards compatible always between two microservices. And finally, typically it is much more difficult to develop locally when you have to touch multiple microservices. When you're developing a single service, you can typically you know, let that service is in isolation and, for example, turn off its third-party calls or hit a live environment. Most of the times, um, developers start up their microservices and connect it to their dev environment and have the dependencies coming there. But then the difficulty starts where oh, you're actually depending on data that's in the dev environment rather than in your local dev database. So like, it, it does, does, does make local development much difficult. So let's look at why microservices are not a silver bullet. And this is mostly expanding on the con side of the previous slide. So it actually all falls down to distributed systems. So distributed systems are essentially not simple. You can't just sit down and write a distributed system. Like it requires a lot of thought, there's a lot of computer science and academic theory behind distributed system. While 
if you look at monoliths, there's there's not a lot of computer science in code. There's a lot of software engineering, a software craftsmanship of how you structure monoliths, but there's not a lot of computer science of actually math and trying to figure out like, oh, what's the cat theorem? How do we do uh, propagation and all these weird things? So there, are, there's this is a very good white paper that covers. Um, I guess the basics of what's, what are the issues around um, distributed computing, and these are eight fallacies that developers tend to forget, right? Developers tend to assume that the network is reliable, that latency is zero, that bandwidth is infinite, right? We, we never think about bandwidth. We just assume, oh, a 10 megabyte response, it's fine, it'll arrive eventually, I guess. The network is secure, right? Like, Especially in, the, in today's age, where we get we hear all these hacking attempts, right? People assume that oh, it's we're just doing a network call, even over. Um, then you need to actually start to do SSL certificates, right? And then suddenly you need to every microservice needs to have the right trust tour set up, and like again, the complexity just come, keeps coming and coming, right? Uh, topology doesn't change, right? Like you always assume that oh. We're, we're all running on the same virtual network, and there's no VPN connection to maybe a different multi-region site, or like, there's, there's a lot of things there. There's only one administrator, right? That's also a fallacy, right? You know, you, you might need to ask this person to configure this stuff, this other person to configure that stuff, reach out to AWS support to fix the, this, and like, there's a whole host of things when you have all these moving parts that you need to configure and set up to get a uh, distributed environment running. Transport costs are zero, right? Like people assume that oh, we can just send it over the wire and it'll get there. But no, it actually you know, has costs in terms of money, but it also has costs in terms of performance. And the network is hom homogeneous. And this is where, for example, people forget that most people are on like 4G connections, uh, clients are on 4G connections and they hit like, oh, uh, your servers in AWS, and there you have a nice, strong environment, but some part of it might be running on IPv4, another one on IPv6, and like, you need like different translations between these different protocols, and it becomes like a lot of, a lot of complexity. And then, talking a bit about performance, right? So when people think like, oh, we'll use microservices, because we want to scale each of these services independently, Actually, performance typically decreases if you're very naive about it, right? Interprocess calls are in the order of nanoseconds, right? Like, I didn't do too much research. It probably can be less, but it's like nanoseconds, the minimal. Network calls is like 10. I don't think any, any service can get under 10 milliseconds, really. I, I haven't seen a, a good case. Like, essentially, to build up a TCP connection, it's already like, 1.5 round trip time. So if you're pinging, for example, between, you can try it out in your own infrastructure. Just fire up uh, SSH into a host, ping another host that you're trying to communicate with, and then if it's like, let's say 10 milliseconds, then it takes 15 milliseconds to build a TCP handshake because it's a three-way three handshake, right? So by default, a TCP connection build is 15, and that's when your application actually starts uh, Yes, you can use persistent TCP connections, but still, the first call is going to be more expensive. And then, for example, AWS has these limits that no TCP connection can take more than 60 seconds, so that's going to be killed if there's no uh, data transfer. And then they, the, the issue that people forget is that sequential networks calls, they stack up, right? If you need to get data from this microservice, use some response, use the data from the response, and call another microservice, then they actually stack up. So if you have a 100 millisecond request here, another 100 millisecond here, then suddenly your best, your best latency is 200, seconds, 200 milliseconds, regardless. And if, for example, if you can parallelize it, that's great, but then you're, you're gonna have to start to do uh, parallel programming, which arguably is much more difficult than, for example, in the case of a monolith, where everything is usually on a single thread. You can get away with, um, single-threaded monolithic applications, like one, one thread per request for quite a while, and it, it scales quite well. So GRBC can help, um, for example, in solving some of these performance issues, and there's a lot of great engineering coming out of these uh, companies, such as Google, 
Netflix and Amazon that are trying to solve these performance problems in the microservice environment. So distributed transactions is also a fun topic. Um, so in the monolith, typically when you have a business event and you need to update 10 entities and 10 database um, tables, then you can just do a single database transaction. The beginning, you start a transaction, just before your request completes, you commit the transaction. And if it committed well, then you return with the 200, right? This is what we typically do in models. But now, let's say we're in a microservice where we receive a request and our transaction is actually across one, two, three other microservices, right? First, you, let's say, need to um, uh, do something here. We'll, I'll show you a diagram very quickly, but like, what if one, one, one call fails but the other sees, succeeds, then what, what, what could we do? And sagas can help with this, and, or an event driven architecture, or like a message based, queue based architecture can help. So here's, for example, an example of booking a trip. Like, let's say we're trying to book a trip, and our transaction consists of three parts one is booking a hotel, the second one is booking a car. The third one is booking a flight, and all of these are in separate microservices, obviously, because uh, they're separate domains, right? We have the hotel booking domain, we have the car booking domain, and the flight booking domain, and they're all in separate um, microservices. So we need to orchestrate this transaction across three different services, and what if like, one of them fails, then we need to actually trigger compensation actions and roll back and cancel the car car um, booking and cancel the hotel. And this is all great and fine, but now, now when you start to think about errors, like what if the cancel fails? What happens then? <laughs> no one really knows. Like you just keep retrying, hope that it eventually succeeds. Now what if one of these services sends an email, right? You can't cancel an email, like it's already sent. Same with push notification. What if it sends a push notification that, oh, your delivery is arriving now. Like, how do you cancel that? And then, you, what, what did you do with the cancel push notification? You said, oops, it's not actually arriving. It'll arrive uh, later. So, um, because of this, like, this is actually quite a difficult problem, and uh, there's, no, there's no easy solution. There's a lot of frameworks out there being developed, but as, we, as, as the microservices environment matures a bit, these tools will unfortunately become more uh, commonplace, more needed, and we will, everyone will have to be writing sagas and you can't get away with a single transaction. Right? So testing also becomes uh, slightly more complex. It's easy when it's inside the same microservice, right? Like inside the microservice. And when you're maybe testing your um, boundaries of like, oh, am I making this HTTP call to this service? But what happens when you want to test all the interactions between these microservices, right? That essentially means like each each of these edges in this graph, they all need to be tested in some way and like verified that this is happening, right? Because of this, it, it, it does become much more complex. And finally, I think like DevOps culture is inbound request from the website or the mobile client, where did that end up? Where did that fail? Like, let's say it, it returns a 500 somewhere and the 500 propagates all the way back to the client. How do you know which service returned the 500? And you need to have distributed chasing for that. Retry strategies, right? Like, when do you stop to retry? What's a sensible time? Is it like one second, 10 seconds? You need to think about these things. Circuit breaking. What happens if a service keeps returning 500? Do you, do you wait a bit? Do you let it, let it cool off a bit? Or do you keep on trying? Back pressure, for example. What if one service is slow to respond? Do you wait until it responds? Or do you just, yeah, back pressure is a separate topic. It's very hard to, to describe in a single sentence. But like rate limiting, metrics collection, A-B testing, for example, A-B testing is an easy thing. 
to uh, explain. Like, how do you A like? Let's say you want to A/B test a feature, but that feature spans many microservices. Like, how do you actually have the feature toggle set correctly across many services? Is it tied to a single request, or is it more tied to a user? Is it tied to a group of users? Like, how do, how do you actually handle that? Does each service then need to integrate with some A/B testing service, or like? These type of questions, which were super easy in monoliths, uh, suddenly become much more difficult. And fault injection, chaos engineering, right? How do you, like in an environment where we just talked about network calls are unreliable, how do you inject errors and how do you test, like, oh, would, it, would, would our microservice architecture survive one node going down here or another node going down here? In a monolith, the answer is simple. I mean, if you have other nodes, then yeah. If you don't, then no. Like, it's, it's a simple problem. Uh, do you have the right learning place, right? If your monolith goes down, you're going to know very quickly. But in the previous like, graph, when you have 100 microservices, how are you sure that every single service has the right learning set up? Like, do you have, like, could you have an, a service that goes down silently and then suddenly a week later you notice, oh, we've missed, we forgot to send, uh, reports to our uh, business partners because that microservice didn't have a learning and that was the one responsible for sending reports. No one knows, like, you know. Do you have the proper health checking in place? So all these questions essentially is like, easy to diss. Like, when your boss tells you we're going to microservices, like, you have these containers because typically Docker is the most common tool and containers when you're going with microservices, but you're like running on these little dingy boats and like, you don't have the proper infrastructure in place to host these containers. So there are some good sides of microservices, and one of it is like API contracts, API contracts, right? You're gonna have to think about APIs first. They're harder to change, which is which is actually a good thing, right? It doesn't allow developers to willy-nilly change things and then think that uh, it's gonna work. Backwards compatibility suddenly is like a must. Like you need to build APIs that last many services, many different versions of clients. The other nice thing about microservices is implementation does not matter. There's a school of thought that says when you, when a new developer needs to like, or when you encounter a microservice that hasn't been maintained for a year, you just like delete it and rewrite it. And, uh, latest, like it's sometimes easier to, for example, let's say you're going, let's say you're doing um, Java, going from Spring Boot 1 to Spring Boot 2. Sometimes it's just easier to delete it and rewrite it. Because it's like, it's supposed to be so small, and the implementation doesn't matter as you have the right API tests. So it forces boundary context. So this is again, going back to the previous thing about, forces you to do domain to redesign it. You would only put a thing in the service if it really belongs there. And failures are slightly contained, so, um, this, this has the benefit of, like, if you do introduce a bug, introduce an issue, it will most likely only impact one single function of the business and not, like, your full monolithic, monolith potentially, right? And this, this actually results in an agility because you can have one, one function of the business constantly releasing and then over the fails and roll back. So you can imagine it's, like, rockets running in parallel or rockets being fired in parallel rather than one rocket taking everyone to the same place, right? You can have business working and business telling or business getting features in regards, regardless of other parts, other microservices are having issues, for example. Like let's say your email sending is having bugs or issues, then you can still be delivering value, for example, in your order checkout to the business, right? But the downside is that they might be contained, but if not done right, they can also cascade. And that's uh, not great. So where does that leave us? So rule of thumb is, first one is obviously think, use your brain. So uh, that, that is uh, a must. So make up your own opinion. These are just general observations. Uh, a good rule of thumb is to start with monoliths. As I mentioned, uh, setup is quicker. So you don't need to spend so much time building out this infrastructure, the distributed logging, the distributed tracing, all these complexities. Simple ways to deliver business value upfront. Like you can, you can much quicker develop a feature in a monolith than you can when it's spread across so many different services. And then refactor into microservices later. So when the team has grown to a considerable size, 
or some functions need better performance. So how do we break down the knowledge? This part is uh, the case studies, but this is also a part that is not talked about too often, right? Of like, we talk about monos, we talk about microservices. What happens in between is like magic. No one, no one really talks about that a lot. Like, how do you go from like ugly monos to like these nice little microservices? And now, uh, before we move on to the case studies, I'd like to open up for any questions, quick questions or comments, and yeah, just to make sure that we understand and are on the same page. Do, do, do we need to give a microphone or not? So the question was, is there any guideline of, if you have a large monolith, how many microservices you break it down? Um, I think the guideline is, is look at your business and look at your domain. And that's where I would definitely recommend reading uh, a book about domain driven design. Um, so if, how, like, if, like that's the guideline essentially, like break it down based on your domain. If you have a domain of um, order checkout, then, yeah, Maybe build that as a microservice. If you have a domain about um, products and your catalog of which products you're selling on your shop, then build that as a separate domain. So there's no general guideline that it's five or four, but it's more about like, look at your business and look at your domain rather than any technical thing. A lot of banking uh, kind of an application, so would it vary or it would be a kind of the same thought process that would go in? Very good question. <laughs> um, I guess I guess the industry does matter slightly, um, and it's mostly due to uh, I guess like the difference between are your systems mission critical, business critical, or no critical, I don't know, I don't know. There's like what the other criticals are, but essentially like how important is it that you're, like how risky are changes and what's the impact of a change and what's the impact of a change going wrong? So I think like, in my opinion, I don't think it should matter in terms of like what domain you're dealing with, um, but it does matter of like how willing business is, like the business team is to buy into such a large architectural change and like, is it, is it possible to do, uh, you know, in, in the context, safely in, inside your own domain? So, um, for example, uh, in healthcare, where uh, we have uh, our systems are essentially uh, actually so occasionally life critical, right? Um, people's lives might depend on our systems, that those require extreme due diligence and every change you know, is, is, is very, needs to be properly tested and just requires more effort, I would say, rather than, it doesn't make it impossible, I would say. And also I think like, one, one thing to add to it, I mean, monoliths, right, the monoliths I've experienced haven't been around for that long, so they've been monoliths for maybe six, seven, eight years. If you're dealing with monoliths from 50 years ago, uh, that, that might be a separate thing. And like financial institutions uh, typically are occasionally run mainframe systems, right? That's like a whole separate thing, right? I think like there you can actually have serious issues of like how do you actually break down that model in the same fashion. Any other questions? We have two. The question is about if you have got let's say two microservices, okay? And each of them have their own set of databases. So another question is if they're sharing some domain and maybe there's some relationship between each other. So how do you decide the ownership of 
whether this service should have it, that service should have it, should have it per database it should have it. Should you do that? Mm. So when when uh, <coughs> it's very hard to uh, talk about these problems in general, um, but I'd, I'd I'd say that uh, when you have two microservices that kind of I would say like depend highly, for example, on each other and are working in the same domain, then the best way to think about it is that you 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 have you have a domain, like two separate domains, and you have a larger domain that encompasses both of them. And then that's where you have actually these two smaller domains, they have references to each other. And I think like that's that's the way I've, I've experienced it, that they kind of need to always exchange typically identifiers like IDs, UIDs, and keep a track of each of each other's state. And and it's, it's not nice. I mean, there are, I wouldn't say like there are bad patterns, like for example, having a shared database, it could work, like, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world. And thankfully, it's, it's a microservice, so it's quite small. So yeah, like if you wanna, if you think like, again, use your brain, like, is, is are we gonna spend a lot of time engineering this chit chat between these terms, two services? Or can we use, for example, a database as a way to lock and do the transactionality across these things? So I'd say, again, you need to kind of evaluate this specific to your use case and see what the domain tells you. Okay, we have a question again? Ah, uh, yes. So um, the best practices are, I can, I can write off a few keywords. I mean, number, the biggest one is reproducible uh, infrastructure. So your infrastructure needs to be reproducible. Typically, what that means is that it's driven from code. So rather than having someone click in uh, some UI and configure their infrastructure, it's actually driven based on some manifest, some uh, definition of how your infrastructure should look like. And tools out there are, um, what are they? Uh, Terraform, for example, Ansible, Chef, Kubernetes, and these type of tools. So um, that's like reproducible architecture, but like when you're actually talking about microservices in different environments, um, the, for example, a lot of companies are using Kubernetes these days and Docker to do this, where they have like essentially Helm charts, which again describe which services run in this environment. And then you just switch out a few environment variables, point in a different um, environment, and then Helm and these tools are so smart that they can just reconcile it and say that, oh, you said here are the set of changes that here's what the infrastructure should look like. I look at the deployments and then diff together and only apply the changes. So like these tools are extremely smart and they can do a very nice reliable architecture where it's easy to do this. Is it necessary to have an API with the Yeah. So I would say the API gateway is a good point. Uh, I didn't actually cover that, but kind of microservices typically do need and or it's advised to have an API gateway. And the purpose of that is to not expose microservices directly to clients, but rather have a facade where you have the flexibility of um, routing requests that take one microservice, route it, for example, to another microservice because you're trying to decommission this one. Let's say you're building a new payment or like a rule execution engine. There's an old version, a new version, and you want to start using the new version. Rather than having every client know about the old version specifically, you have an API gateway where you can do rewrites and do all these uh, uh, cross-cutting concerns. So actually the cross-cutting concerns such as authentication, authorization, all these can happen at your API gateway level rather than every single service needing to know how do I authenticate this request? How do I make sure that this person is uh, authorized to do this? So I think like authentication is a very good example of why you do it because you don't want every single service 
knowing how to parse a pair token and make sure that this user is authenticated. Uh, yeah, I guess the practical limitation in terms of like tools, the tools or technologies, like uh, one popular open source API gateway is Kong, for example, Kong API gateway, um, you can have that, and then pointing to your Kubernetes infrastructure, and then inside Kubernetes you have a ton of tools such as ETCD and uh, Linkerd and all these different sidecars that you can attach onto your thing. Unfortunately, I'm not actually a DevOps person. I sit on slightly the other side, of the application side of things. So I, I, I'm a bit like hand wavy around the specifics of its infrastructure, like which tools. But I, but um, yeah, Kubernetes is powerful, but it's also slightly complex. Back. Do you get over insights from? And, uh, yeah, so the two case studies will provide some. Yeah. So, can you repeat that? I think we will slightly touch on it. Um, so it, if I understand correctly, like edging is, if there's another concept that is um, gaining popularity, which is backend for frontends and having API gateways collate multiple services, uh, responses from multiple services and put together one single response. Is that the area you're asking about? Or? Mm. Mm. Yeah, so I, I found um, GraphQL to be immensely powerful for this. GraphQL. So when we're talking about like microservices, right, it is essentially a graph, and your data is a graph where one thing's referencing one thing, and that thing is referencing another thing, and then to collate this, query this, and mutate it, where GraphQL by Facebook is an immensely powerful tool and is capable of doing this, where clients essentially request a data of how it should look like, and then the GraphQL engine can, like, has a schema of like where this data is located, and that can be spread across hundreds of microservices, and then it makes all the calls Whatever it can do in parallel, whatever it can't, it's sequential, and it collates back the response and returns one thing for the client. This is extremely popular with React and web content, but GraphQL is actually getting pushed into more um, more uh, mobile API clients and other other clients, and even maybe backends starting to use GraphQL to do rather than doing the backends, figuring out all these different dependencies between where the data is located. They can hit a central thing that can knows where all the data is and does all the calls for it. So, uh, in this of time, we can approach a person. So, we just break up, uh, take a break as a now. Uh, one quick point. Uh, oh, thanks, Akosh. Uh, so, so, basically, uh, this time is meant for snacks and network. So, when, when someone asks to define success, Success is all about knowing the correct person for the correct time for the correct opportunity. Okay. 
So microservices are lots of drawbacks. Um, are you scared? I mean, does it make sense to do microservices if uh, there's so much of trade-off and so much of overhead, uh, right? Significantly, uh, it requires a lot of work. So we do it probably only when you have a significant uh, momentum, right? So quick uh, show of hands. Uh, how many of uh, you work in a startup? Awesome. All right, great. So uh, I hope uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have monoliths too, right? And and if a startup has a monolith which is uh, showing performance uh, bottlenecks, that's a good problem to solve. It means you, know, you are successful and you have arrived, right? So uh, wish you luck. Um, uh, for others, uh, how many of you are uh, have worked on or or going to work on? Uh, Building up a monolith. Do you think that you'll soon you're either working on a, a microservice already or you are planning to? Or do you think you're going to soon? Anyone? All right. Okay. Great. Uh, and the last question <laughs> How many of you have worked on uh, server side rendering? Django or Ruby and Rails or ASP, .NET, JSP. Okay, right? All right. Cool. So you'll probably understand the pain better. <laughs> All right. For others, I'll try to uh, convey the sentiment. Um, right. So, uh, case study one. Uh, I'm still working on it uh, with my team. And uh, here we are uh, trying to break up uh, a carve out one microservice from the monolith. Uh, there are parallel efforts to create more microservices from it. So my team is working on, on one aspect or one microservice only. Uh, we, uh, are ho we hope to go live by the end of this year, so we are still working on it. And uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll explain you, I'll try to show you the quantum of the problem. Right? Uh, and then uh, how we have done, or we are doing it from back end. Uh, how we are doing the uh, separation for UI and maybe what the infrastructure might require to sustain that. Okay. Um, so, this picture should be familiar. Um, so, our monolith is on Ruby on Rails. Uh, there are uh, 160 tables, more than 160 tables uh, in this system. Uh, over 380 server side. Uh, Pages that are rendered, the pages, and over 180 API endpoints. Uh, so it's a lot of, lot of uh, crisscross spaghetti, both in the UI as well as in the business logic. Uh, and especially if you have uh, worked on server side pages, server side rendering, you know that the way you access one uh, column and uh, another table, so different column is you know, a.c, a.b.c, and you can just quickly reference one table from another based on the relationship and you have that. So it's very easy to mix different domains because right, just reading, uh, uh, it's just a uh, difference, three reference by dot and you have the, the uh, column from any table that is somehow related to directly or indirectly. Okay. So uh, the domain that we are expanding out, let's call that promotions. And uh, that's the problem statement we are working on. And uh, we are also tasked with recreating the UI because currently the UI is, is server side rendered, so we don't want it. We want it to be like a single page application or or an independent uh, React component. So we are also working on that. Uh, this domain promotions, which is part of the bigger system, has uh, multiple tables, uh, I think two or three or four, under five, and uh, it has uh, one of the biggest tables has forty five fields in it. It has 30 relationships to different tables, right? And uh, those 380 server side pages that we're talking about, about 100 of them have information from promotions in some way or the other. Uh, and uh, 50 out of 180 API endpoints contain information from promotions. Right? So I'll try to show you how we are working on separating out the backend. And uh, so we have data stores which contains 160 tables and so 
and more length which talks to multiple services. I've just listed out emails and notifications here, uh, quite simple. Um, and then the same monolith serves uh, web portal users, which with all these 380 views, and it also serves iOS and Android users with uh, different endpoints, API endpoints exposed to cons for consumption. Um, so in phase one, and we are doing this, this is a phased uh, gradual migration from monolith to microservices. So uh, in phase one, what we're doing is uh, we are uh, still working with the same database, uh, creating, recreating uh, the business logic in a microservice, which is in uh, <coughs> which is in uh, Java, Spring Boot, and uh, yep, and then we, those integration. Uh, with email notifications also exist in the promotions microservice. Now you might wonder why we are doing this uh, redundancy here, right? Because the same uh, microservice and monolith, they are both talking to the same database, both talking to similar uh, systems. So uh, the reason is because uh, since this is phase one, we want only the uh, web portal to access microservice whereas the iOS and Android users, we still want them to use the monolith. We want to try this here first, and if successful, or, uh, no, when successful, we'll move it out. Hopefully, it'll be quick. Uh, so, uh, so, right. Uh, and also, because promotions earlier was part of monolith, and it talks to different tables, which are different domains, essentially, uh, we, had to create or we had created endpoints in the monolith that promotions talks to. So when promotions needs data, even though it, it, it looks like it is uh, sharing the database, it is sharing the database only for the promotions domain. Uh, for other domains, it does not read the information from table directly. It uh, reads from the microservice or uh, reads from the API exposed on the monolith. Okay, That's the uh, arrow from promotions microservice to monolith, right? And uh, in, in phase two, this is where we switch over completely and all uh, web users and mobile app users now talk to promotions and now promotions has its own data store. Uh, promotions still talks to monolith for the domains which have not been extracted out yet. So if promotion, suppose you want to, oh, by the way, uh, let me go back to the previous slide and I just an important detail here, which is, so say you are creating a promotion and you schedule the promotion to go live and you want to say cancel the promotion. So it's possible that you create the promotion through web, uh, but you might want to cancel it from apps or you cancel promotion from app but you might want to cancel from web right? so it's it's uh, transparent to the users uh, they wouldn't know whether they created it from, from app from, from the microservice or monolith but essentially it's all connected so you can create promotions from web and still view them on apps and you know, interact with them in any other way and uh, the other way around also So in phase two, uh, which and, and phase one is not live yet, we are still working on that. Uh, phase two is when we perform the data migration. So those uh, tables which are specific to promotions microservice only uh, will be moved away, uh, moved out to promotions database, and uh, the integration that were uh, no longer required or they were required only for promotions are now only sitting in the microservice and not. With monolith. So we still decommission the old components, we clean up the database and so on. So this is phase two is when we think that we have achieved that segregation. That's the uh, backend story. Uh, UI separation is a little more involved and we are still working on the details, but I'll share what I know so far. Uh, so let's say that this is uh, this is your uh, view rendered from, from the monolith. 
and this is a sketch what I took from uh, New York Times today. Um, so there, there is a static component and there is a dynamic component. So usually you have headers here. Let's uh, uh, headers and then let's say the uh, content changes. So depending on what you click, content changes, but headers is supposed to be the same. So uh, earlier it is, it is all from uh, the monolith. All servers have rendered pages. Now what we uh, are doing here is how do we gradually move from server side rendered pages to uh, React Conference, which is our uh, choice of technology. Uh, so, in this case, what we've done is we have uh, created uh, a React container. Uh, the whole web page is React, and within an iframe, we load the legacy app. So, when you uh, so the uh, the complete app itself is React, but in, when you click on, say, uh, politics, then you'll, the politics page will load in this iframe, but you click on uh, New York, it will, that piece will load in this iframe. And the new components, which probably are within this, when you click on that and, and say a new content opens, that content needs to be from the microservice, or that content needs, it should not be, again, a server-side page. So then we have a communication channel between uh, the uh, React container and the React components. So the, we achieve that using uh, JavaScript events. So this event listener that we have set up, and when you click on a link, which is in a legacy app, the legacy app opens a new content, or a new window for the content, and that content needs to come from uh, microservice, right? So what we do is, uh, that microservice now talks to, that content now talks to microservice instead of talking to more or less. Uh, but then the question is, how do you uh, show content which is from, both from microservice as well as more or less? Because usually you will need content from multiple domains, not just single domain, right? So in that case, we use GraphQL, as Ampush pointed out. Uh, we use GraphQL uh, to uh, basically mix and match and, and combine different APIs and, and produce the content. Um, right. So uh, that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, on the infrastructure side, we have Kubernetes for deployment and we, uh, we have uh, logging and alerting set up and you know, how you trace your request through multiple microservices uh, you know, we uh, we have request IDs uh, in every handshake. So we ensure that when you hit request and it, it bounces off all different uh, the entire mesh, uh, you are able to get a clear picture of how the control flow has happened. And all these services are authenticated, so they they first get authentication token and then talk to other other uh, services. All right, uh, we are still working on something, some open questions. Uh, one, one question, for example, is uh, in this UI separation, say, uh, it, it, this works fine when you have a new component, right? You have a new React component, and that component uh, displays content from your microservice uh, and legacy, so you can use GraphQL to combine the results and display. But what happens to your old APIs, which your, your, your uh, apps are using, right? Uh, won't they miss out on some promotions information because now that does not live in monolith anymore? What happens to the other views, 100 odd views, which are using promotions content? Now how do you how do you uh, plug in this missing information? Uh, so we are still working on that. Uh, I think uh, GraphQL might come to rescue uh, for the first scenario, which is combining. Uh, the legacy or monolith APIs with microservice APIs and serving the uh, apps uh, for the uh, server side pages which are still in monolith, that's a little more uh, complex uh, problem. Okay. Uh, also, uh, we are working on handling uh, distributed transactions and rollbacks. It's not sorted out yet, we're still working on that, and also the target migration is working on live. Uh, that's all. Yeah, questions. I have two questions. The very first question is how are you handling the distributed cost management? Because uh, from several devices, you have the multiple authentication. That's 
third question, mm -hmm. and the second question is, uh, what is the performance difference after introducing the? I know maybe it's a work in progress, but then is there any visible performance difference? Is not increased in this process? Sure. sure. I think there, there are two questions, right? One question is, uh, what is the uh, what is the performance impact? And the second question, uh, or this is the second question. The first question was, uh, how do you manage authorization? Um, so, authorization we are piggybacking on uh, existing systems. So we are so we have say a role service or a, or an identity service, which is giving us the uh, authentic I mean, whether a user is authorized to perform an action or not. We are still relying on an external service to provide us that information. Uh, very similar to what is there existing or uh, in this existing system, no change there. Uh, for uh, uh, performance, uh, sorry, yeah, per performance. Uh, same question. Performance is uh, we expect a performance uh, hit, uh, but then in the existing system, there are thirty or so relationships, right? So uh, some queries are extremely slow. Uh, so we maybe might be able to solve that, but then uh, this microservice or or any system, any view will depend on not just my microservice, but also the existing monolith APIs. Right? So it's uh, slowest with the weakest link. So we, uh, we'll have to work on performance. Yes. One is first question. Uh, so you say uh, you are using identity service, right? So how do you pass, if you have tokenized the all parameters of tokenization based uh, on because uh, every microservice be able to you know, because the data still needs to be shared with, between all the microservices, right? So, what exactly do you share between services and then uh, pass that on to the identity service? So, the question is uh, how uh, authentication works between services because you need to still get a token and pass it around. Yeah, so you said based on token. So yeah, I mean, so you have a user authentication mechanism, and you have a service authentication mechanism. Both can use the same system, say OAuth, or they can use different systems. Uh, to keep things simple, you can keep it same, which is that the same authentication. So you can treat a service as a user and give it its own credentials, and then it can request for a token on the, uh, from the identity service and pass that token around to the other. Uh, services. You can do that. Okay. Yeah, it, it, yeah, I mean, all communications must be secure, right? And that was eight fallacies of uh, uh, life. Okay, right, right, right. No, we are using the HTTPS. That's for it is for APIs, mostly it's for APIs. Is there answer question? Coming to uh, uh, microservices speaking, so how do we deal with the common functionality or reusable components, something like uh, in our previous example, like accounts domain and sales domain, but all are actually data. Schema is different, but uh, connecting that is open, right? all these things are common. Right, it's an excellent question. Uh, so the question is, uh, most of, most of these services will use a common pattern, uh, database read write or authentication, right? Uh, excellent question. And uh, in in this setup, uh, what you can do is have uh, create. A component of sort of library that can be used by different projects. So you can have a, an organization wide uh, library. Does it make sense? <laughs> to 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 wait. So you can, you can create something uh, like an authentication, uh, say, you no, know, OAuth from my organization, and then everyone uses this. This they put this uh, in your just jar in your project, and then you get that. Uh, functionality to connect to uh, request authentication without actually going
going through you know API refresh, token refresh, expiry, 401, all that. Okay. I have a question. Um, yeah, so you said that uh, your monolith is in Rails. And uh, you know, what have you chosen for your new microservices? Uh, Java has been good. Thanks. Just one question. I think I should probably clarify that this uh, was an enforced choice. So we didn't have really uh, an option on that. Okay. And, uh, okay. So, yeah, since it's enforced, it cannot be just stuck. So you don't have a chance. I was just wondering if you have multiple text stacks. Uh, yes, we. I mean, we do have multiple text stack in this particular service. We are using JavaScript Boot, but I'm aware of other services which are using Ruby on Rails again. Uh, Scala. Uh, there might be a few more. I cannot. Yeah, but um, mostly, mostly, uh, I think it's, it's JavaScript Boot, but also a bit, bit of, of Scala. This is from my information. I could be wrong. I lifted the knowledge on this. All right, great. If there are no more questions, I'll hand it over to Adil. Yeah, I think so. Where you can just catch them up after it works. We have no other questions. Yeah, hello. Is it already? Yeah, yeah, fine. So, uh, thanks, Chandan, uh, for setting up the context and uh, thanks for Akush also. Uh, yeah, here uh, I just want to uh, take a different case study. So, who's it's like it's familiar to everybody here. So, the case study that I wanted to talk here is like one of the luxury retail store. So, it's a US based luxury retail store. Okay, so the project that I worked before. Uh, so can you imagine like uh, what kind of problems that we will face like when when the end user is going and buying your products in online? Okay. So can you imagine uh, this kind of application existing in monolith by 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 understanding about all these parts, uh, all this right? So can we uh, imagine like if our retail application if it is in a monolith, what kind of problems that we might face? Right, so it's, it's like, like let's say if there is a season, so Dasara and Diwali or uh, Christmas, there's a season and lot of discounts are happening. So it's like number of number of use hits are more, right? So we need to we need to be scaled, right? So scaling a monolith application is not very simple, right? So or let's say uh, we wanted to have a good user experience, right? So we wanted to have a good user experience only for certain piece of thing. Right? So, so it's like making the change in the monolith and then deploying them easily, I don't think it's possible, right? I mean, you can't deploy uh, the small change in a week or a two weeks, right? It takes like months. So it's like it takes like two months to deploy that and you need to test the entire application, right? So, yeah. So, with that context, so I just wanted to uh, set up, I, I just wanted to focus more on the backend side. So instead of focusing more on the uh, front end uh, separation and the backend separation, I just wanted to focus more on the uh, database separation here. So before, before I'm jumping into the database separation, I just wanted to uh, stress here on that, it's like when we are talking about a retail application, it's like we are talking about two different groups, two different users, right? So one is like end users who wants to purchase something, so who wants to buy something, right? So the other users who manages entire inventory, right? So creating the products, creating the categories, creating the SKUs, medias, images, everything, dumping into the database and making them available for the users. So the end users who's going to uh, search them browse, uh, like for buying a shoe, uh, we, we do multiple clicks, multiple search, everything. Uh, we do a lot of filterings. 
40 years. So it's like if when I'm when I'm talking about two different groups here, so the end users will be just like a read-only users. So the other users like admins who manages the inventory, the product everything, it just writes the data to the database. Right? So with this context, so let's see uh, here. Uh, so this is just a rough uh, architecture. This is not the actual architecture, but I just wanted to talk like here. So you create a product, you manage the orders, and then you insert the data into the database. Right, so here you read the data and then you manage this into particular categories. So let's say if I'm creating a shoe, it should be, uh, it should, uh, if I'm saying a shoes, it should come under the shoe category. If it is a dresses, it should come into men's categories or women's categories or whatever it is, right? So all the category management, everything will be done here. So and then, and then uh, data will be dumped into the database. So here in this architecture, we are exclusively using Oracle uh, ADC. So, so Oracle ATG here, uh, uh, it's like highly uh, configurable and it's mainly built for the uh, making e-commerce search to be easy. It's, I, th I think we can think in like a CMS kind of thing. I mean, it's not exactly that, but it's like easy for the e-commerce to build their sites, right? And, and it talks to the Oracle DB here. And now there's an Indica, Indica here. So what this Endica does is it, it pulls the data from the database and it does the indexing data. It will make our search to be, uh, our, our data will be available for the search, right? And then it pushes the index data here and then ATC will serve the data to the UI, right? So this is typically core uh, monolith application that what we are having now, uh, what we have currently, uh, and then now, when it comes to the uh, problem, right? So with this problem is like scaling, as, as I'm saying, so scaling application is very huge. And making a smaller changes also is taking more time. And then we, we wanted to separate, we wanted to reduce the load from the database. Uh, I mean, I'm saying like it's a two different users. One is writes the data, another one is reads the data, right? So what if we separate out of these two users into two different things? like Whoever wants to read, let them read from uh, some other data source. So why can't why can't we maintain this database as a core database where we main, where we just store our information, right? So now here, the solution that what we come up with here it is. So we added a uh, we, we we added a triggers into the Oracle database. So let's say when there is any product update comes, or when when there is any a uh, skew updates comes. I just wanted to say a number of tables I'm having. So here in this portion, if you look at, these are the tables, it's just uh, sample tables I'm just giving it. There are n number of tables here, but these are the main uh, commonly used uh, tables. So uh, one is like a category, so uh, other is products, skews, recommendation, promotions, user profiles, and adornments and prices. Uh, Anything, so right? It has its own relationships again, right? So when when I'm when I'm saying when there is a trigger, let's say when there is any update to the category or when there is an update to the product, so it, our ATC DB will trigger a uh, database trigger to the RabbitMQ. So here RabbitMQ we are using as a messaging queue, right? So it takes the uh, information, it, it it takes the uh, and it it put it, it, it keeps everything into a queue. Now, the entire data is in the queue. Now, so we identified multiple services. So, category has its own logic, a business logic. Products, to display the products, it has its own business logic. Right? To display the prices, it has its own logic. So, so that's why we identified the domain models and we, we, we separated it into the multiple core microservices. So these are microservices. So products as its own business logic, use and promotions, user profiles, and the category. Right? So each service has its own data source. Here we are using an elastic search because so uh, generally our search should be very faster. Right? And we know like elastic search is like very quick searches. Right? A lot of 
go back. Yeah, so and also it, it provides a very quick swipes we can do. I mean, a lot of uh, uh, other advantages as well. So that's why, so we are using an elastic size as our data source just for reading, right? So now each service will interact with the queue messaging system. It will pulls every time. Is there any event that I can store? So suppose, for example, product, if there is any change, product message is here. So this will listen to this rabbit and queue and it will always get the product's data and store it into Elasticsearch. Now, so we have data in all our places, but still we have a original data in our Rabbit database. Right? So now when when the when we wanted to browse from the UI, so it hits its own here we call it as a capability services or BR backend for frontend. So here we uh, we are saying it's a product list. That means we need to get a list of products. We need to display the products. It's not just only the product, right? So we need to display the emails. We need to display promotions. We need to display prices. We need to display announcements, right? So a lot of other things, right? So that everything has to be orchestrated here, right? So it talks to it knows product listing. What are the services that it has to call? So it will make a call to the other other core services, it gets the data and then it composes to the UI and it gives it, right? So it's like that simple. Now, now there is no reads from the uh, Oracle data, uh, ATG database and, and even if the Oracle database is down, still we can serve the end users with, with the data that what we are having in Elasticsearch. Right? So, so here, uh, so at the end, so what it becomes, or architecture like literally like this. So still, so there is a UI, 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 and then it talks to the ATC. Then now instead of talking to the ATC, now we have another UI, and we have a toggles here. So instead of talking to the legacy monolith application, we talk to the new service, and then this one will will call our orchestrator services and each orchestrator service will call its own service, core services. So so that's how like, we, uh, we reduce the load from the actual Oracle database. Is it clear? Then, yeah. So I think I can take some questions if you have any. So, if the complexity of an application means what type of complexity? Uh, if the complexity in your business logic it, it comes, I mean, we will always change with them. Uh, in the microservices. I mean, just we relay uh, it is just for the data. So until unless there is no uh, data change, uh, there is no schema change of anything, we don't rely on the actual database. So whatever it is, everything has to be happened in the microservices. Yeah. I was trying to understand the, the migration aspect. So initially, when uh, the new data that is coming in, you are know, taking the triggers and then distributing it to Rabbit and and going to the new microservices. But then, how is that initially separated and seeded into? So you already have some running data to work with data. So, how is that initially seeded into yeah. these databases? So, the yeah. implemented part is there, but then the initial part. Yeah, so apart from uh, the actual triggers, when there is an update, instead of that, we also have a kind of like a full sync or like on demand sync. So it's like when you set up a new instance or when something is crashed or something, so you, you wanted to dump everything, right? So you you do it in the nightly or, or you just point, point your application to the ATC 
and then uh, you make microservices data to be synced from the ATC, and and you make your uh, microservices to be available, and then you toggle back to the microservice. Yeah. Yes, so searching records is getting improved. So here, so I'm searching a data from an elastic search instead of searching from the uh, my relations, relational database. Yeah, so each service has its own data service. Like, so when we don't uh, search, uh, I mean, it's, let's say product uh, SKUs and products tables, two, ta two different tables are there, right? So now you want to display uh, a web page with a list of products, right? So obviously uh, you don't, you can't display only just the products, right? You also get the SKUs, SKUs information, right? So when when the SKU information is available in your elastic search, so what else like you want on it? Yeah, maybe I think we can have uh, offline I mean, if I'm not understanding the question. Yeah. How are you? Load test. Yeah, so we use the same method. Not sure about the patterns, but we use JMeter for the load test. Yeah, so the, in the elastic set, you can create a multiple clusters and then we can uh, distribute them on. Or we can still use only one elastic set instead of that one. But this was the initial one, and then the maybe release to uh, maybe we might think about like optimizing these things. So, uh, which one is the better? Like getting Yeah, I think unless until like our infrastructure is like, I mean, good enough, I mean, it's very highly scalable. I mean, then we can go ahead with one single data source, elastic set, and with the multiple clusters and multiple indexes on that. Of things. Yeah, I think uh, that's it. I mean, uh, there will be a feedback comes. I think uh, we could provide a feedback for our next teammates, or you can uh, you can uh, give some feedback for us. sharing all these insights. So, yeah, please fill up those uh, feedback forms. So it helps us to verify what, what went away, what can we go.
Yes, we have this uh, all this presentation well recorded and uh, screen live stream and we all have your details. And at least I will be sharing the links of the recording to you. This is the first one. This is the first live Thank you. 